We're going to continue talking about Bayesian model uh, averaging and model selection. So let me just. Does anyone have any questions before I kind of keep going on? So. Um, yeah. Will we have presentations next Wednesday and Friday? Yeah, next Wednesday and Friday. Yeah. Okay. Because on the syllabus. I mean, there the, may be the dates off by one day, but as I've said a bunch of times, it's like during regular class time. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, during regular class time. And everyone should show up to the other students' presentations. So let me just remind you of the setting we're in here. And so we have um, model uncertainty. So we have some model index M. So that's our unknown model. And then we have some, <coughs> some list of models um, script M. And so that's a, just a bunch of different possible models. And so in the case where we have regression, it's different possible subsets, but it, it's much broader than that. It could be any possible uh, list of models. And so in this setting, if we're doing a Bayesian approach, we, we choose a prior probability for each model. We choose priors for the coefficients within each model. And then based on those two pieces, then we can get posterior model probabilities. <coughs> and so this is, would be the, the, the probability of model M, little m, given the data, but marginalizing out everything else. Okay, mar marginalizing over our priors, over our, our likelihood um, under each model. Okay, and so the uh, so the posterior model probability of model little m is proportional to the prior model probability times the marginal likelihood, and the marginal likelihood is just the likelihood um, under that model, conditional on the parameters in that model, and then instead of maximizing them, we need to get rid of the parameters somehow, so we we marginalize over the prior. That's sort of the Bayesian way to do that, and as I mentioned last time, that might be somewhat sensitive to the prior, but but will in any event be controlling the penalty on model complexity. And so the marginal likelihood will be be um, it's not going to just get bigger and bigger as you as you add more and more predictors in your model. It's going to tend to favor a um, a small model that explains the data well uh, if the prior is well chosen. Okay. Okay, and so the um to sort of like mention these things already. And so let me just skip skip forward. Let me talk about the base factor. And so let's let's go over Bayesian model averaging. Okay. And so I, I did that quite quickly at the end, so let's talk about that again. And so if you have a list of models, let's just go over a simple example on the, on the board. We might have um, we might have some setting where we have we have YI. In this case it's um it's either zero or one, so we have disease or not. Okay, and so we might have some sort of xi, some sort of exposure risk factor. Okay, um, and let's say the zi is a set of um, sort of covariates. You know, and these might be pos possible confounders. Et cetera. Okay, and so if we have this setting, then then you know one possible model we could use would be the the, the log of the probability that yi equals one given xi and zi uh, divided by the probability that yi equals zero given xi and zi. Okay, so this is the this guy right here is quite a Shorthand is pi i divided by one minus pi i. So this is the um, the log odds of disease. Okay, and so this is like a logistic regression model, and then we might have an intercept. We might add. Um, let's make it like it's like alpha plus beta xi plus um, psi. Ci, like this. Ci prime psi. Okay, and so this is a logistic regression model. Regression model. Okay, and so what what type of model uncertainty might, might we be interested in in this setting? Let's say we want to do inferences on on this exposure, whether there's a, a an association, sort of a significant. Association between y and x adjusting for, for these covariates z. Then, well, we we might be interested in in something like h naught might be um, beta is equal to zero. That's sort of like no exposure effect in quotes. 
Um, and H1 might be beta. Beta, I should see. Yeah, beta. Beta is not equal to zero. This is some, some sort of exposure effect. OK? So let, let's say that, that that's sort of our overarching. That's a, that's let, let's say that's our primary interest. Okay, so that's primary interest sort of one. But uh, our second primary interest in epidemiology is often um, we we, we, want, we might want to estimate the um, the sort of adjusted sort of covariate adjusted exposure odds. Ratio. Okay, so we want the um, the odds ratio for someone who's exposed ha has X at some level um, C plus one um, divided by the odds ratio for someone who has X at some level C. Okay, and so if we, we figure out what that is and we go through it mathematically, it's just going to be e to the b beta. So this is the odds odds ratio that we're interested in. Okay, and so it's going to be adjusted for these other factors, but the actual um, interpretation doesn't depend on that adjustment. No, it does in some sense, but the parameter doesn't depend on the adjustment. Okay, and so this is our second interest. And so what? Um, so now we talked about last time about how we can allow for model uh, different aspects of model uncertainty. Let's say we wanted to do that in this um, applied context, where we're really interested in whether there's an exposure effect adjusting for these other predictors. Um, and, and we might also want to estimate it an, an odds ratio. Okay. So how can we do that? And what, what type of model uncertainty do we have? Do you, do you always want to include the same covariate but in the, the predictors, like the next i? Do you always want to have the same set, or do you want to? Well, yeah. I mean, like we've been we've talked a lot last time about. Um, we don't know which predictor is in the model. And so that's like an important aspect of model uncertainty. So that was sort of, yeah, sort of what I was looking for. Like we, we don't know um, we don't know whether H naught is true or H1 is true. So that's one thing. We don't know whether this beta is zero or not. But we also don't know what, what adjustment variables uh, other covariates to put in the model. Okay. And so so we could imagine writing down a list of models. Um, so using our sort of notation, we have sort of, sort of this is our list of models. Okay, so we could we could expand this little guy out and call this the sum from j equals one to q of z i j psi j. Okay, and so we might say or a list of models. Um, model um, we might have beta equals zero. Psi one equals zero. Psi j j equals one to two to q or not equal to zero. Okay, that would be one model. Okay, you see, so that that would be like there's there's no exposure effect. Um, uh, the first um, covariates not in the model. The, the other covariates are in the model, and so we'd have many models having different variants on. Having an exposure effect or not, having different covariates or not. So, so how many models then are we, will we have in our, our list of models? Here's the number. Yeah. So the number here is what? It's just okay. So we have we have two to the q plus one. So we have q covariates, and then we have this one exposure fact. And so we that that's either zero or not. And each of these Q things are either zero or not. And so it ends up being there's two possibilities for each of, of Q plus one things. And so the, the, the sort of, um, you could write that as like the cardinality of this set is um, two to the Q plus one. OK? Um, and so, <coughs> so if we're interested in our overarching interest, how could we address this interest? What might we use as some sort of weight of evidence in favor of, say, H1. Probability so, of posterior is greater than zero. Yeah, I mean, just the probability, poster probability on H1, yeah. The, pro the posterior probability that beta is not equal to zero. I mean, if we, well, let's say we have a two-sided. If it's one-sided, it's 
so much easier. Um, and so, so we want to. We might want to estimate the probability that H one is true given our data. We have data from n subjects. Okay. And so, so how can we how can we estimate that? Conceptually, forgetting about the um, how do we do the computation? You know, like we want to just write this down mathematically. Let's see whether including x in our models improves the predictions. Yeah, no, I, I mean you could do that in terms of um, as a sort of informal way to see whether you need x. You could you could do cross validation and then try to put x in the model and see what how how the sample prediction was improved. But if you wanted to estimate how, if you wanted to estimate this guy, like if I wanted to say, well, this is equal to something. Um, well, this is a Bayesian. This is a probability of H one. Um, and we, we talked about sort of doing um, <coughs> allowing model uncertainty in the setting where we have different subsets. And this is one particular structured problem of that. So we, we would want to, like I just gave the slide where if you have variable selection uncertainty, what do you want to do? You want to put in priors over the different models, and then you put um, priors on the coefficients in each model. And so then you can you work through the math and you can figure out the probabilities on each model. So this isn't one particular model in our list. This is actually like a, a marginal um, probability. It's like a marginal inclusion probability for one of the predictors. But we can write this down to sort of a simple function of the of the um, model probabilities. So let, let's kind of go go through that. So let's say that, that we just have gamma um, equals the gamma j is equal to one or zero, so that's if 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 the uh, j covariate <coughs> is in the model zero otherwise. Okay, and so then we have um, for the covariates we have this like gamma vector gamma one through gamma q. Okay, and so that's that takes one of um, that's in some set um, zero to one to the q. Okay. And so that just encodes which of the covariates we put in the model. Um, and then we also have H0 and H1. That's the other aspect. Okay, So we can, we can write down our list of models. So we have our list of models. So we might have a model is like, um, models are like, uh, we have uh, H1. Gamma, like list of models from, you know, for um, okay, and then we also have H naught, gamma, you know, for all possible gamma and zero one. So we can like write our model list of models like that. Does that make sense to everyone? So we're just saying, oh, well, there's a bunch of models. Half the models have, have the exposure in it, and half the models don't. And among the, the models that have the exposure in it, we're looking at all possible um, ways to, um, all possible covariates to put in the model. Okay. So we want to allow for uncertainty in, in, in adjusting for the covariates. What would people usually do? They try to find a model, and then you would like estimate the coefficients on the co covariates for that model. Um, and then do inferences on data, but that, that might not be very good because we wouldn't be allowing for uncertainty in the covariates we're adjusting for, which that uncertainty might be really important if we have tons and tons of covariates. So we're trying to do that here. Um, okay, and so we, um, so now we just need, um, we, 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 might, um, we might say, oh, the pri prior probability on H0 is equal to 0.5, and then, um, and then, you know, uniform, uh, over um, the possible gammas. Okay, so that, that would give us a prior over the model space. So that's the first part. And then what else do we need? We we need a we need a, um, a prior on the coefficients in each of the models. And so then we could just we could choo choose a variety of things there. Things that are often thought to be good are, are what are called G priors. I'm not going to go into that. Right now, but we could just say, let's just say, for example, beta 
um, is normal zero sigma beta squared, and then we then we let the um, you know if you know if it's in the model, and then the 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 the, the covariates that are in the model, they have parameter psi j is just let's just say they're independent normal just for simplicity. Okay. And so that gives us a prior on the um, so, so these are four four gamma j equal to one. B and so that's um uh, for h one. Okay, and so under under this, then we can we have all the components. We have a logistic regression likelihood. We have priors. We can calculate the poster model probability. And so I'm going to go through right after this. How do we actually do that sort of, sort of calculation? But let's we'll just wave by hands initially and just say we can calculate these things. And so we go through the calculation, and we end up with getting oh the probability that we have. Um, Say H1 and a particular gamma, um, given the data. Okay, or our data is y and n. What's that going to be? It's going to be the probability of H1, the um, the probability that of, of that gamma um, times what? So it's a marginal likelihood of the data under that model, and so we would take the logistic regression model. We would put in all the covariates that have that, that have gamma j equal to one, and then we would marginalize it over the prior, marginalize out the coefficients, and so we end up with a a likelihood of y, y given x and given h one and, and gamma. Okay, and now that's and then we have to write like okay, well this is um over um. The probability of H1, probability of, let's call it gamma star, likelihood of Y, X, H1, gamma star, and we would then sum over gamma star um, and gamma, let's call it <coughs> gamma, gamma, this guy, gamma, gamma, and then we would, we would also add gamma star and gamma probability of H1. Not okay. So then, what this is just normalizing. So we have we have two to the q plus one possible models. Half of them have the exposure in it. Half don't have the exposure in it. The, the sort of total. Um, I mean, so, so if, you, if you have one with exposure in it, that's, we have the probability that all hypothesis is 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 false. We have the exposure. We have some other set of confounders. So that's this is the the probability, poster probability is proportional to this, and then we just normalize over the same type of thing for all possible other models. Okay? <coughs> and so that gives us a poster probability on um, on a particular model, which is has exposure and it has some set of, of covariates. Okay? <laughs> and so how, how do we get how do we get this guy um, fr from that? From those pieces. Take out the pieces with H1. The what? Take out the pieces with H1. Yeah, so how do you take out the pieces? So this is a joint probability of two things. So it's the probability of H1 and gamma, and so we, we don't we don't want the joint probability, we want the mar marginal probability of, of H1, and so if you want to if you want to get the marginal probability from the joint probability, what do you do? Marginalize over gamma. You marginalize over gamma, and so how how exactly do we marginalize over uh, out gamma? Yeah, we take a sum, and so this is going to be the sum over all all possible gamma, and so I'm writing all possible gamma as this cap gamma, and so that's just all possible zero ones in each of the elements of, um, of the probability of H1 and gamma given the data, which is Y in there. Okay, and so that that this is the um, this is the marginal probability marginal probability of H1. Okay, so that's really cool. Actually, I like that a lot because that now I I don't I, I've allowed uncertainty. 
and how I've adjusted for, for the covariance in, in assessing this hypothesis instead of sort of plugging in some guess um, at the covariance facts. Okay. Um, and so how might, might we then uh, make it, say we wanted to make a decision um, about whether to go with the, the null hypothesis being true for the alternative. Well, th this sort of gives you a weight of evidence. It's like a probability of H1. And so if it's like 0.5, around 0.5, what does that mean? Yeah, there's like no evidence in the data either way. It's like, it's ambiguous. And so as it becomes, as it moves away from 0.5 and goes closer to 1, then that becomes what? A lot more evidence, and so you know, it's like it, it's something. It gives you something like a. It's a sometimes they call the probability of H not a, a Bayesian p-value, because it, it's a probability. It's like not not, not a p-value at all. And so people get annoyed by that expression, but it, it's something that you can use in place of a p-value, which which if it's very close to zero, that that gives you um, actually a lot of evidence against the null hypothesis. But unlike Frequentist hypothesis testing, we also get we can get evidence in favor of the um, of the null hypothesis as well, and so we, we might have the probability of null hypothesis is 0.99 or something, and so we we can get strong evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. Often, what happens is that as you get more data, if the alternative is true, this might go to one very quickly, but if the null is true, this might not go to one very quickly. It might it might, it might not go to zero very quickly. I mean might go to zero very, very slowly. And so, um, you know, as an exercise that you don't have to turn in, <laughs> you, you can actually you, you can actually work this out if, in, in a very simple case. Let's say your null hypothesis is you have a coin. And you're flipping a coin, and your null hypothesis is that it's a fair coin. So your null hypothesis is that the P, the probability that you get a head, is 0.5, okay? And so you have the marginal likelihood of that. Let's say you take N coin flips. And you get um, you get x heads, okay? Well, I have the likelihood it's just like well, it's 0.5 under Bernoulli. It's like just like 0.5 raised to the um, raised to the n. So it's a likelihood. Okay? And so now now we want the likelihood under the alternative. Under the alternative, what's the alternative? We don't know what it is. It's something other than 0.5, and we give a beta prior to that unknown probability. And now we have a binomial likelihood, and we marginalize it over beta prior, and so then we get a closed form. Okay. So now we have the marginal likely in closed form in each case, and, and you can actually um, look at what happens. Um, and, and so what, what tends to happen is that even if even if the if the truth was a um, was a fair coin, that that <coughs> it, these marginal probabilities, the posterior probability is going to be very very close to 0.5 for a very long time. You're going to need, need a lot a lot of um, coin flips. You know, let's say if you took a, a uniform prior, like a beta um, one one prior, and so that that tends to tends to be so it's something to remember anyway. That it, it tends to be nice and that it it'll go. We we could say that it'll give evidence in favor of the null hypothesis, but the the rate at which that evidence builds up is tends to be quite slow. Um, if it if you ha if the alternative is true though, that tends to be faster. Depends on the context, but in these simple kind of parametric models, um, tends to work well. And so this is a type of model averaging. So I mentioned this is Bayesian model averaging at the top. Um, we're model averaging here. You can see is that oh we we want the mar a marginal probability of H one, and we're averaging over all these different possible models, okay, um, adjustment models. If you take this, it's average. Um, okay, so that's one type of model averaging. But what what if we wanted to get a a posterior distribution on on beta? Okay, so now instead of getting the marginal posterior probability of, of H1, we want the um, we want some marginal posterior uh, uh, density of beta, um, or let, let's not even say beta. Let's say marginal posterior density of e to the beta, given y and n, y and x. Okay, so this is our um, this is our odds ratio that we're in. we're really interested in this odds ratio. Um, actually, yeah. I guess we have our z there too. Is just data. Okay, so how, how can we get that? So we did 
do the same thing. We're always using these sort of um, simple probability rules, and so how could we do it if we had, if we knew H, whether it's H1 or H0, and if, if we knew, well, I mean, if, if, what, what, what would it be um, in this case, given H0 and other stuff? It's just a, a degenerate, the posterior distribution is the degenerate distribution um, having a unit mass at one. So that, this you could say was equal in distribution to delta one. Okay, so it's a, just a, it says probab probability one with gamma, let's say we have that, yn, xn, zn. How, how can we like, write that down mathematically? Well, when you have something complicated like that, you want to like break it up into pieces, you know? And so we, we, we might have, okay, well this is a, 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 this is just some sort of tra transformation of pi of beta um, given H1, gamma, yn, xn, zn. Okay, so this is just um, this is just a, a coefficient in a logistic regression. Okay. Under a particular model, so here we're conditioning on the model, and so, so what's that going to be? Well, that's going to be something that well, it's, it's a logistic regression where we're taking the, the prior and we're updating with the um, the likelihood, and then we might have the tr trouble calculating that closed form, but we can count, it'll make you have samples from this easily. Okay. So under under particular under a particular model, we can draw samples from the posterior distribution. How do we do that? We get we just look at the beta samples. We have samples from the marginal posterior for beta under that model, and if we wanted to get samples from the the marginal posterior for the odds ratio, which is e to the beta, what do we do? We just exponentiate each sample. We 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 don't take the mean and then exponentiate afterwards because that would give us totally the wrong answer. We exponentiate each sample, and then we can get samples from this guy. Okay. And so that, that's just sort of like vanilla at this point, particular logistic regression model, okay? And, and then if we wanted to take out uncertainty in gamma, how could we do that? Just mathematically, again, forgetting about how we could actually calculate this thing. We just integrate it out again. So how do we integrate it out? Well, we multiply by the probability of gamma given the data, and given we're in H1, say. Um, and that, now that's the, the joint probability. That's a joint distribution of E to the beta and gamma. And now we want to marginalize that gamma, so we just take a big sum over all possible models. And so, so what that's going to end up being is like, oh, well, that's just like this guy. Now if we want to marginalize out gamma, we just we want to get pi of E to the beta given say H1 and Y and X and Z, well, we can write that as, well, that's going to be equal to, we're going to take a big sum over all gammas in <coughs> all possible um, subsets of those, those predictors, and now, now we're going to multiply this thing um, by what? By the uh, probability of gamma. Yeah. And then we would have, um, say, given H1, given um, y, n, x, n, z, n. Okay, so we're multiplying those. They're not divided by them. Multiplying that by that, that gives us the joint probability of the joint distribution of e to the beta and gamma. And then to get rid of the gamma to get to marginalize, we just we just sum over possible gammas. Okay? And so that would be, this would give us a model averaged um, posterior distribution for the odds ratio. And then you could potentially uh, group these two together. It's model average under H1. And so um, so you can get, if the exposure is in the model, you can get from, from this, it'd be easy to get a, a mean and get a, get a credible interval for the for the odds ratio. That's, a, that, that's adjusted for covariates, but, but model average across the possible adjustments. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, that's the sort of thing. We can also do prediction, and I, I talked about that a little last time, and I want to get to the um, Computation, and so I'll I'll just kind of put up the plot again. So, so we talked about this last time. We could do in this case we might want to do prediction of y 
um, given x, but then averaging over the models. And so uh, we'd have um, the uh, probability of disease for a future subject given their predictor, given their exposure, and given their um, z's. Okay, let's just say this x n plus 1 includes both their exposure and disease, and that would be over the possible models, the poster model probability times the probability of disease um, given a particular set of predictors. Okay, and so that would be a model average prediction. Okay, so what about practical issues? And so we, we actually would like to um, um, do computation for these things, and so you have to um, compute things like the marginal likelihood, and that seems quite daunting because the marginal likelihood is that, that um, the sort of inability for us to compute that or accurately approximate it is the whole reason we went to MC in, MC in the first place, is you had the posterior and it was proportional to the prior times the likelihood and divided by this thing, which is this big nasty integral of the prior times the likelihood that's not available in a nice form. And so the beauty of MCMC MC is that we bypassed having to calculate that integral. Okay? But it seems like these marginal likelihoods are coming in everywhere when we're doing this model uncertainty. Um, and so that's, that's annoying. And so can, can we do something about that? And so, so marginal likelihoods really aren't automatically pr produced by typical MCMC -MC algorithms. There is a literature trying to use MCMC -MC to calculate approximations to marginal likelihoods or Monte Carlo methods. I would, if you ever see a method like that, you, you view it very skeptical, skeptically because they, they, they don't tend to work very well. So there's many, probably hundreds of papers on that type of subject, but they, they work pretty poorly in general. Um, uh, routine Im implementations, like if you had this logistic regression model and, and one of you had an application and you, you, were, you were doing logistic regression and you wanted to allow for model uncertainty to do model averaging, I, I would probably just use the Laplace approximation. Um, unless you're in a high dimensional or um, some nasty setting, the Laplace approximation often works quite well. You know, if, if you didn't have some large p, small n, or you have hundreds and hundreds of predictors or something like that, you could you could approximate the uh, posterior distribution reasonably well with a Laplace approximation. And there's a rich literature. There's even an R package um, doing Bayesian model averaging relying on the, and, and generalized linear models relying on the Laplace approximation. Um, another big issue that comes in is you might have noticed that when, when we were kind of working through these calculations over here, that when, when you're, you're calculating things like this, that you have the, you're, you're constantly having these like, sums over all possible models. Okay, and so oh, well, there's two to the q plus one models, and so um, two to the q plus one is huge if q is even modestly big. So um, so you can't usually do this sum over everything. And so that's another practical problem. And so what people do um, as an alternative is to do a sort of search algorithm. And so we have we might have some big model space. This is our gamma. We don't know. We don't know where the true model is in that. Um, and so instead of instead of visiting every single model and calculating the marginal likelihood, poster model probability, obtaining obtaining some Laplace approximation to it, we, we run some sort of search algorithm. And so we try to we try to identify a list of good models. And so what one of the um, actually useful uh, methods um, that that Valinsky Valinsky was one of the winners of the Net Netflix prize, and, and Adrian Rafferty. Um, put into their package is is to just run stepwise selection, um, like frequent stepwise selection. It, it, look at the path, and so you visit a bunch of models in stepwise selection, and you just model average across the path. It's really really fast to run stepwise selection. We're not instead of assuming that the final selected model is the right model, we just we just want a, a list of decent models, and then we model average across them. Instead of trying to visit all billion models or more than a billion models. Um, it's a sort of a pragmatic approach that might might work quite well in practice to give us some idea of model un un uncertainty. A lot, a lot of um, approaches, sort of ensemble approaches in, in machine learning, they just sort of randomly generate piles of models and then and then fit each model and then give some sort of score to each model based on how well it's fitting, penalized for model complexity or something, and then just average them based on those scores. You know, so, so things like that are very successful, like random forests or like that. And so, so these kind of poor man's um, approximations to the the full base of model averaging, where you could fit, go through every model, um, um, often work quite well. Okay, and so there's there's a nice tutorial by Jennifer Hoding um, on on Bayesian model averaging, which is a, maybe a little out of date, but right now. But. Okay, so let's say we're doing variable selection, 
there, there's something called a stochastic search, which often works really quite well, um, which is a little bit more uh, disciplined than just sort of running stepwise and then model averaging over the stepwise path. And so let's say we start with a, a vector of candidate predictors. We have p candidate predictors, since we might just be in a normal linear regression model or probit model. And so we don't know which predictors to include in the model. And so we have two to the p uh, different models, but we don't want to visit e every one of these models. And so we want to run some sort of, say, MCMC. Um, and, and the gain here is we might have some encompassing model. We're going to run some sort of MCMC that's going to sort of stochastically move using MCMC across the model space. We're not going to visit every model, but then based on that stochastic search, we're going to obtain estimates of the marginal inclusion probabilities and model average predictions and other things we care about. Okay, and so there's a really nice paper, and particularly, um, I wouldn't look too much at the 93 JASA paper, but there's a 97 longer Statistica Seneca paper um, kind of giving a, a review of uh, lots of different methods for stochastic search variable selection. And so these approaches have been really widely used, and so I'm going to sort of go through the steps um, through, through that DDE preterm birth application and so, sh sort of show you how it works practically. Okay, and so um, before we had, had this model from last time where you had the probability that there's a, a premature delivery in pregnancy I given some pr predictors XI, just a probit model. Okay, so this is a st standard normal cumulative distribution function of this linear predictor XI prime beta. Okay, and so, um, so previously what we did is we just fit that one model using data augmentation um, give sampling, and so we just we put all of the predictors in the model. We, we didn't have that many in this case, but it's just an illustrative example. Um, and, and then we just put all the predictors in the model. We just chose a, a Gaussian prior. Okay. And so what we can do to, to allow for uncertainty is instead um, do exactly what we were talking before. It's, it's, it's totally equivalent to, to choosing a, a prior on each of the possible subsets, and then as well as a prior on the coefficients in each model. But we can we could write it um, for sort of organizational purposes to keep bookkeeping simple in this way. And so this is a, a joint prior on beta, and we're sort of acting like we're living in the full model with all the predictors in it. But we're choosing this fancy prior, which instead of just being a normal on the coefficients, it's a mixture of a normal and a mass of zero. And so these priors are really, really, really useful in a lot of settings. And so we're we're saying, oh, with probability, so this is a, across the P predictors with a J predictor with probability P not J, we, we return exactly zero. And so we sample from this with probability P not J, we get a zero for beta J, and then maybe for the for another predictor, we in, instead don't um, um, sample from this component because the P not J um, probability head doesn't come up, and so we get a tail and we sample from this component. So you could easily sample from this in R just by you sample a Bernoulli um, with this probability. If you get a one, you, you return a zero as a coefficient. If you get a zero, you sample the coefficient from a normal distribution. Okay, and so every time you sample, you're going to get sort of a slightly different um, sequence of, of of zeros and non-zero coefficients. And so in that, in this case over here, if we just we stack the covariates and the exposure together, it might be in the first time we sample from the prior. It, the exposure is thrown out, and we get a particular set of um, covariates in the model. Okay, and so th this is often what's called a point mass mixture prior, because this is a point mass of zero, this mixed with a normal distribution. And so if you if you kind of draw the prior, what it looks like, it's and it's like you're independently sampling from a mass of zero mixed with a, a normal distribution centered at zero. Okay, and so this this corresponds to Excluding the predictor, if we sample from this component, <coughs> and if we sample from this component, it corresponds to um, including the predictor, and then and then this this continuous density gives a prior of what the coefficient values are. Okay. And so, what would be, what would, well, how how could we, if we wanted, if we wanted to figure out what prior this um, this put on the set of predictors that are included. But we just have a, a, a given sequence. The model is just a sequence of zeros and ones. So if we had zero, 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 if we, every time we sample from this, for all from j equals one to p, we we got zero every time. What would that correspond to? That would be like the null model. We'd be throwing out all the predictors. Okay. 
And so if we have a sparse model, what would that correspond to? Like maybe P is pretty big, but we want a sparse model. That means like most things are zero, and we have a few non-zeros. How could we like favor that in this prior? Yeah, so we might we might often in practice, if you're if you're in a given application, you might know there's the predictors are different. You know, you're taking this objective Bayes approach, or you have historical information or something. You might choose very different P naught J's for your different predictors because predictors a priori aren't really exchangeable. You have information on them, but but if you don't have that information or you wanted to maintain some appearance of objectivity anyway, you might. It's often more common to drop the J subscript, and then you just have one probability of inclusion, okay, or, or exclusion. And so you can, if that, if that, if that's pretty big, then most things are excluded, and you have a sparse model, a favor sparse model. And in practice, you can choose for that P naught without the J. You can choose the beta hyper prior to allow to allow the uh, more flexible prior on the model size, because if, if you just let P naught be fixed. What's the prior on the model size going to be? The model size, that's the number of predictors in the model. We have P candidate predictors, and then we're going to get some random number, uh, say Q, of, of predictors that are in the model. And so that's going to be, if we just make the P dots be fixed for all J, then that's going to have some simple distribution. What distribution is that? The binomial. Yeah, so it's going to be, um, it's going to be like the, the PDF will be, P choose Q, P naught raised to the P minus Q, 1 minus P naught raised to the Q. Okay. And so it'll just be a binomial. And so if you look at a binomial, it's very restrictive. It's like if we chose 0.5 for P naught, it would be like we're, we're really pretty strongly think about half the predictors in the model. And so if, if P is very big, we would we might even put like almost zero probability on on the null model, and so in general, if, when you're using this, um, unless you have some real subjective prior information or something, you, you don't want to fix P naught. You want to put a beta prior on it. Um, that's kind of a nice thing to do. J James Scott and Jim Berger have some nice work on that. There's a nice, very beautiful paper by um, Castilla and, and Van der Vaart coming out in the Annals of Statistics, which is pretty hard to read. But. But it, 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 <laughs> the bottom line is it's oh, well, P naught is beta 1, 1 plus kappa times P or something. And that's a really nice prior for sparse problems and gives very nice nice results. And so that, that's one justification for choosing a beta prior. OK, so anyway, so this is a really nice, very, very widely used prior. And so how do we apply it in practice? And so, so we can do stochastic search variable selection. OK, and so. Remember, we had this data augmentation Gibbs sample. What was that like before? Before we, we were including all the predictors in the model, we had um, P predictors, we had a, a multivariate normal, and then we would we would impute a bunch of latent um, vari uh, continuous variables, Zs, and then conditionally on those Zs, we have like a normal linear regression model, and then the, the conditional posterior for the betas is, is a multivariate normal. Okay, And so it's actually, if we choose this type of prior, one of the nice things about it is if you have a normal linear model, um, whether you had a normal linear model to start with or you use a probe it and you do data augmentation, the, the conditional posterior of, of beta j is going to be in the same form. It's conditionally conjugate. Okay? So you, you update, um, you look at the, the prior for beta j is just like that. It's a point mass at zero mixed with a, a normal, while the, the posterior distribution for beta j conditionally on everything else. That, that's going to be a point mass of zero mixed with the normal, and the, the point mass probability is going to be updated from the prior probability, uh, and, and these parameters in the normal are going to be updated. In fact, what, one thing that's really cool is you're, you're all really used to driving the conditional posterior without the point mass, and so if you do that, um, that's going to be exactly what the mean and the variance are in the normal. So if you just work through without the point mass, um, well, without the point mass, it would just be like, Oh, uh, we have um, we have a, a the prior beta j is just normal, like this. Okay, and so we could figure out what the conditional um, posterior distribution was for beta j under that prior. That's going to have an updated mean and variance. We can just plug those in, and that's going to be what the post the post the conditional posterior mean and variance in that component are. And then we'll have something just slightly more complicated, 
um, for the updated point mass probabilities. It's quite quite easy to work through, really. Um, and so, so if we have that, what can we do? Well, we can just sample from the full conditional distributions. And so we do the probit thing. We, we impute all our, our latent variables, our z's. And now, now they're just all these continuous variables are imputed. Now we, we, we cycle through sampling from the full conditional distributions under this prior. So what's that going to do? Well, I'm sampling the first one. I sample from something that's a weight on 0 mixed with a normal. And so I'm, I'm like, well, it might be zero at one Gibbs iteration for that predictor, and then so so you're gonna every Gibbs iteration you might get a slightly different subset of predictors in your model. Okay, and so in that way you're gonna be doing this stochastic search across the model space. Yeah. It seems to me if you have predictors dropping out and coming back into your model at each step like this, you have two betas that are correlated. Or if you have like a Simpsons paradox going on, it's going to rip havoc on your mixing. Yeah. So the um, the, the beta is being correlated. Um, you mean a posteriori, and the, and the reason that the beta because here they're uncorrelated in the prior, and so the um, the reasons the betas are are correlated usually a posteriori is if the predictors have high dependence, and so wh where where you run into problems with some mixing with this is if you have a bunch of predictors and there's collinearity in the predictors. And so if there's collinear in the predictors, if I have if I'm in like say linear regression and I have two predictors that are really highly correlated, I don't really care which one's in. And so what'll happen with this, and you're right, is that I stick one of them in and then I don't need to put the other one in. And so if I'm doing I'm doing conditionally updating, I, I, I go to the other one and then I'm like, oh I don't really need that one. So I hang out for many iterations with the one end, and then I might switch and then hang out with the other one in. And so you get this sort of stick, you can get some stickiness for that reason. Um, there's some tricks around that. You could um, actually, the the, um, the full posterior distribution is available in closed form too. You just have to have a problem with summing across all the different possible, um, possible choices of models. And so you can potentially update the model indicators in blocks if you put the correlated predictors together in a block. And so you can do clever things like that. But it, it, it tends to work surprisingly well. And if you just care about prediction, the stickiness caused by very correlated predictors, um, you, don't, you don't mind so much. But if you care about inferences, that might kill you. So like, yeah, I, I want to do inferences on whether this exposure is important. And I have a bunch of, I have several variables that are really correlated. Like, in epidemiology, sometimes I get I get different conjugates or metabolites of the same exposure. I just put them all in; they're all very highly correlated. I'm going to get dilution. I'm going to only I'm only going to include one of those, and then the margin. Even even if I need if they're even if they're over really important overall, I might get a 0.25 or something <laughs> marginal inclusion probability. So yeah, that that definitely happens. It's not as bad as it seems because the correlation has to be pretty high. Okay, and so let's kind of go through these steps to make it concrete. And so we, we can we can use our data augmentation Gibbs sampler we described earlier, and uh, if we were, had linear regression, we wouldn't even need to need the data augmentation. And so what we do is we just um, we sample from the conditional posterior distributions of beta j for each for j equals one to p. Okay, and so we for, we we first of course we we impute all the z's from their truncated normal. That doesn't change at all relative to what we talked about before, you just have some of the regression coefficients are exactly zero. That's no big deal. And now I update um, from from the con full conditional distributions of each of the beta j's, and so now it's like I said, it's a, the point mass is zero with some updated probability mixed with a normal with some updated mean and variance. And so the uh, if you look at the mean and variance, it should look pretty familiar at this point. So the um, the, the the variance, the conditional posterior to variance is um, this is the prior precision plus, um, here we're in a probit model, so sigma squared is 1, so you end up with this x prime x, and it's just the prior precision plus x prime mass inverse, and then um, um, in this case I've centered the prior at 0, and so we just end up with that variance times x prime z. So if you had, if you had a, a, a very flat prior, which would be, I'll ask you about that in a minute, so, so if, if you look at the conditional and we set cj equal to 0, then, then, then the ex the conditional expectation, if the predictor was in the model, would just be x prime x inverse x prime z. So just the least squares estimator um, with the z plugged in for the response. Okay. 
do we want to do that? That being set the variance equal to high. So, so if we have, if we go back to this prior, um, so we have this prior sort of a point mass. Some people are calling like sort of spike and slab. You have like sort of spike is there, and you have a like slab normal, which is more high high variance. Um, and so, so we could think the. I mean, well, what what if we want to be really non-informative? Do we want to let, let let the CJ be really really big? Why or why not? Yeah, so the, that creates this Bartlett-Lindley paradox, and so you're as you blow, you're blowing up the variance. The, um, the, the, the this part this part is controlling the prior in the model space, and this is, is putting coefficients on on the, uh, the prior on the coefficients in the model, and so the prior the coefficients of the model is just independent normals, and so the bigger models you're gonna you're gonna be marginalizing over more independent normals, and and you're gonna get that that paradox, and so. If you blow up CJ, that's a really bad idea because it, it, it's going to what it's going to do is it's going to um, increasingly favor the smaller model, and so you're going to get increasing um, um, probability on this point mass as, as CJ blows up. And so then you might ask, well, how the heck do I choose CJ? I might be quite sensitive to that, and and there is a literature on on, on that. In this setting, we might do things like normalize the predictors um, prior to to analysis, and then just to Choose CJ to be modest, like one or two, or three, or something, and then hopefully it's pretty robust within if it's in a rough, rough ballpark. Um, that's one one pragmatic approach you can take. You can also do something fancier, like a, a G prior, which we won't have time to talk about in this course. But if you take other courses, you'll hear about. Okay. Um, yeah. So what? So what about the other piece? I could work through the algebra on this. What, if you wanted to derive this in your leisure. Um, then you could just, what is it? It's going to be, oh, we have the augmented posterior. You have um, all our unknowns. What are our unknowns? Our unknowns are betas and z. Okay, and so now we have the prior for beta. Here's the prior for beta. We multiply by the likelihood for z, which is this normal linear likelihood, um, and normal linear model likelihood with the betas in linearly with regression coefficients. And then we multiply by the conditional likelihood of y given z. So that, that y and z piece is exactly the same as last time, and so updating the z's is just truncated normals. And so the interesting part is the conditional of the betas. And so if we look at the conditional of 1 beta j, we, we would, again, do this thing where we throw out everything except for stuff involving beta j. So we get, we get this piece, and then we're going to get t times a normal um, likelihood of, of, of z i minus the, the, the impact of all the other predictors other than the j. And then, then the mean of that nor normal will be xij beta j, okay? And so then you have a product of that over, over, over from i equals one to n. And so you're just going to end up with this point mass at zero times the normal times the normal linear likelihood, um, that where it only involves beta j because we got rid of everything else by by standardizing z i appropriately. And so, so then it's really easy. It's just you just have to figure out the normalizing constant. And when you do that, when you work through the algebra. You get this right here. So the, um, the, the, the this is the updated the, the conditional posterior probability of excluding the the J predictor from the model, um, given all the other predictors that are currently in the model and their coefficients, which is encoded on that. You could there's ways to do it slightly more efficiently than this, but this is easy, so I'll describe it this way. And it often works quite well. And so the, what is this? Well, this is the um, the prior probability. Of including that predictor um, divided by the prior probability of, of excluding that predictor divided by the prior probability of excluding that predictor plus the prior probability of including it times this ratio. Okay, and so um, what's this ratio? Well, this is just the, the density at zero under the prior over the density at zero um, under the posterior. Okay, so it's quite quite simple. Yeah. Are those axes just the g problem of the x? Matrix the whole design Yes, that's wonderful. That's a um, that's a typo, yeah. Definitely. So this should be the J column. Yeah. Right there and right there. Otherwise this would be a this would be a P by P matrix and this is a scalar. So that, that should just be the J column. Any other typos? No. 
So just xj, xj. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, so yeah, so th this is actually can, if if the if the prior probabilities are are the same, if they were 0.5, then this would all cancel out and it would just be one over one plus something would actually um, uh, turns out to be the, um, the the base factor. Okay, and so it's just this very simple expression. And so ratio of marginal likelihoods. And so you, we can compute all these things, and we can do this in R very easily. And I could give you the R code if you want, um, because I used it to generate the, the results in these slides. But I didn't put the typo in my code, so it will actually work. <laughs> OK, and so, so we run this. And I, I say after convergence, but that, 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 that's a question sometimes in these things. If, you, if, you're, if your number of candidate predictors was really big, um, it might be that we're, we're not really necessarily counting on convergence of the MCMC algorithm in the usual sense in that, well, what if we have 100 billion models or 200 trillion models? We run this 5,000 iterations. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're only going to visit a tiny fraction of the models. Um, and so you, you, your results might still stabilize and be robust across different starting points, and, and you might end up with pretty good results. But you're still getting sort of a, a pretty rough approximation to the, to the true posterior. And so that's good to keep in mind. Um, but, but after, anyway, so at, we're generating samples of models. We probably want to throw out an initial burn in, and then we get different subsets of peak candidate predictors from each, each draw. And we also get these uh, um, probably lots and lots of models, and I haven't even visited a model, then the sort of naive MCMC estimate of the model probability would be zero for all the models I haven't visited. And maybe maybe a lot of the models I've visited I haven't visited very much. And so um, it might be tough to estimate the poster probabilities of individual models, but but that's the bad news. The good news is that um, that that we can estimate marginal inclusion probabilities m m much better. And so that that would be um, include the exposure variable or what what proportion of iterates do I include this particular predictor? Okay. And so those are called marginal inclusion probabilities, and people very often base inferences on the marginal inclusion probabilities. And there, there's been some nice work by um, Jim Berger suggesting that um, if, the, uh, if, if your design is orthogonal, if your predictors are orthogonal, and, and your, your goal is prediction, and you wanted to look at um, selecting the one best model in terms of predictive performance, then the right thing to do is to use the median probability model. And so the median probability model, we we calculate, we run, run our thing, we calculate the, the, um, the marginal inclusion probability for each predictor, and we cut it off at 0.5. And we throw out the predictors that have marginal inclusion probabilities below 0.5, and we include the ones that have marginal inclusion probabilities above 0.5, and that gives us one model. And so if you want to select one model, um, I would say that's a lot better thing to do than to select the model with the highest posterior probability. Um, that's the sort of one model that gives you the best predictive performance. Um, you're laughing at me. <laughs> okay, so the um, the full model. So so an example, the full model might appear in 10% of the samples collected after convergence. Um, so that model would be assigned a poster probability of 0.1. And and if as you add more and more predictors and more interesting problems, you're actually going to uh, you might get that the the best model might only have a tiny. Um, Post your probability. Okay, and so you could you could summarize the uncertainty by presenting a table of the top ten or hundred models, um, and, and as I mentioned, it might be a lot more useful to calculate marginal inclusion probabilities. And so here's to just let's get give a flavor for the samples, and then we got to end a little early because you have to nail me in the evaluation. Um, but then so this is what the the trace plot looked like um, for samples from the posterior under a, just a normal prior without the variable selection. Okay. And so these are just, you know, every the variable is always in the model, always in the model. It doesn't make that great, but it looks pretty good under the data augmentation Gibbs sampler. And so, so here's what we get under the um, uh, under the uh, stochastic search variable selection. So the intercept was always in the model across all iterations. And so, so here you can see the mixing is actually pretty darn good. Um, and so here's the here's the um, yeah, actually, this isn't the intercept. This is the DDE coefficient. And so that was always in the model across 5,000 iterations. And here's each of the different um, coefficients for the covariance for our, our, our potential confounders. And so 
you can see that the samples kind of switch between hanging out uh, at positive values and then being right at zero. And the, the interesting thing is that there's sort of a gap there. Um, that was quite interesting. But but um, yeah, so it, it doesn't it doesn't actually hang out at zero for a long time and then switch back that much. Um, and so you can see that if you remember a little bit from the last time, there was a couple of predictors that were very insignificant uh, based on p values, and those were these actually. So this one. It's like pretty cool. It's like, oh, if I have an ambiguous p value, like p value 0.1 or something, I'm like, I could partly put it in. You know, it's like, it's in not very many of the iterations here. And then, so here it's in, in more, and then it's sort of the amount of time it's in, a predictor is sort of proportional to the posterior probability on that. And so it, it gives you a lot better. Um, I think model averaging is great, actually. Um, yeah, so from that, this is just the trace plots. We can sort of summarize these results. Okay, and so they, the samples congregate on zero for the regression coefficients that are, are not as important. Um, and so that, 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 at that sample, the, that predictor was excluded. Um, and so, so in the, the normal prior analysis, um, when we're throwing everything in, we get something that's not that, that different from the uh, frequentist results, except we don't have a p-value. We, we just have means and standard deviations and credible intervals. If we do this fancier approach, that, then, then we get... Um, we get this sort of shrinkage to zero, and we also get a posterior probability that each coefficient is zero. That's what I call the marginal inclusion probability. And so in this example, or the marginal exclusion probability, because it's zero. And so, so that's your Bayesian p-value. Um, and so in this example, the DDE Bayesian p-value was zero, and the, um, or the, for the intercept it was zero, and this is the DDE. And then for these other ones, you can see that, well, this guy, we added 95, 98% probability of um, excluding the predictor. So that was kind of cool. And so that, that was the same one, if you looked in the frequentist analysis, where it had a very insignificant um, p-value. And so you can see, you can kind of, if you look at the sort of standard deviations, um, here you see, see that it kind of kind of goes down, down quite a bit, because it's sort of pulling these things towards zero. And so if you look at the results as you throw in more and more predictors, this, this mixture prior analysis is going to do massively better um, than the other one, because we don't, we're sort of uh, favoring sparsity, throwing out things we don't need, um, and that's going to reduce um, mean square error, and it's going to improve our performance in estimating things we care about, like in this case, the uh, DDE slope. Okay. So this is my, what I was talking about in terms of maybe way too many significant digits. <laughs> <laughs> I only ran it 5,000 times, but I know like, there's a problem precision. <laughs> I think I've probably cut and paste but, um, from the R outputs. But, um, anyway, so this is the, uh, the poster probability. I've just ordered the models um, by the poster probabilities. And, and since I only had, like, whatever it was, seven predictors in this case, I actually had a couple of models that were much higher but you can see it's pretty, it's still pretty ambiguous. And so in th this model, the top model, like throughout all of the, um, all of the adjustment variables, um, and the second best model, which was pretty much the same, <laughs> it, it put it in two. And so that that it was quite a, maybe a totally different conclusion. And so if you if you did the thing that, it's like I've heard ten thousand talks where people are doing this. They're trying to search around for the best something. And then they get the best something, and then they look at it, and they think that's the truth, and they interpret things like that. Um, and so, so th in this case, you can see that the poster prob model probabilities are, you can't really distinguish these models. Um, but they're very different in terms of the interpretation. But you can see that it's sort of like moving in and out of the um, 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 covariates, but always the DDEs. And so there was pretty strong evidence of the, the DDE. So maybe it's a, too simple of an example to illustrate in some sense. Um, so, so in this case, we, we only visited 20% of the models, and there wasn't a single dominant model. Um, but, but all the better models included the third and fifth of the five possible confounders. Um, that's not true. <laughs> okay, ignore that. <laughs> um, okay, so, so I think this provides a really useful approach. There, there's another, a, a number of, like, fancy alternatives, um, like shotgun stochastic search, where you try to, you try to, do better and sort of moving around fast um, in the predictor space, um, but I don't have time to talk about any of that because you need to um, evaluate me. And so um, there, there's two different piles here. The one, the pink, the pink one is this one is for the undergrads, the, the blue, and then the yellow is for the graduate students. Okay. And so if you can, if you can like do these and then give them to someone and then somebody take them to Karen, that'd be great. It's been fun.
Well, I'll see you next week anyway.